Hi, everyone. Over to you, David. Ed, thanks so much. Over 130 years ago, Andrew Carnegie helped to found, charter, and initiate an institution of performance and of artistic value that to this day resonates globally with us. Their archive is a, and digital asset management systems are accomplishments of great meaning and great educational, historical, and present day value. Many of the assets in the Carnegie Hall system include some recorded systems. Little did we know that we would have an opportunity to make use of that technology today when one half of our leadership team from Carnegie Hall decided to check her voice in baggage claim and has not yet returned. But we were fortunate to have a recording of her presentation. So today we will hear from Catherine Gonsbill and Jen Gunenberg from Carnegie Hall. Jen is with me here on camera. Catherine is going to be listening in and we're delighted to have her insights join us as I turn the presentation over to one of the world's most extraordinary performance centers, Carnegie Hall. Catherine and Jen, thank you so much. Hi, I'm Catherine Gronsfell from the Rose Archives and Museum at Carnegie Hall and historic content and data from the archives. Today, my colleague Jen and I will be sharing our takeaways from the first decade of DAM at Carnegie Hall. I joined the team eight years ago, so I have the gift of hindsight for the Hall's program. The organization's resources, paired with the access we have to peers in cultural heritage across the globe, allows Carnegie Hall's history to inform current business practices while being shared with the world through historic resources impacted by the stories from the archives. Before I jump into DAM at Carnegie Hall, it's important to define how the archives talks about Carnegie Hall in a historic context. We look at the hall as a lens through which we see and understand the world. The histories of music and art, culture and celebration, people and politics, and generally of New York City and the United States are all interconnected and interdependent um, on the people and performances that have graced the legendary stages and virtual spaces of the hall. Efforts over the last 30 years to increase access to historic material highlight these stories. Partnering with scholars like Dr. Portia Maltzby, who created a timeline of African-American music to map inspiration, evolution, and connection in genres and subgenres. The timeline, or TAM, launched in the early 2000s and relaunched recently to modernize both the technology and content. Aspects of the TAM aligned so well with archives research that we were able to include the use of performance history linked open data to leverage Wikipedia and Wikidata resources and inform the release of the TAM's web CMS source code on Carnegie Hall's public GitHub page. In addition to technical areas of contribution, Archives was invited to the reboot to source material from the Hall's historic digital collections, providing the opportunity to share these materials specifically with a motivated and interested audience. Digitized flyers and ephemera are all managed and accessed by staff and TAM partners via our dams. From the dams, staff can learn, for example, that this Nina Simone record in the middle was curated in both the online TAM and a Rose Museum exhibit focusing on social and political activism at the hall in the 1960s. Since it was built, the hall has served as a gathering space for more than just music. Political meetings and rallies filled seats over the years. An example on the left where Andrew Carnegie organized and led a national arbitration and peace conference prior to the beginning of World War I. Domestic life has space at the hall as well. Religious meetings, social and cultural communities and activists all met regularly at the hall. Labor groups and unions consistently met, including the event image on the right from the International Ladies Garment Workers Convention in the 1940s. Archives continues to seek out ways to surface and share as much as we can with as many people as we can. We've partnered with major access platforms like Google Arts and Culture for Exhibits, which shares historic content in both curated form and as part of a global library of cultural heritage items. And when you hear the name Carnegie Hall, you may think of classical music, orchestras, or maybe the Beatles or Judy Garland or Ella Fitzgerald. Um, and 
So throughout this presentation, Jen and I will be sharing parts of the hall's history, which may seem unexpected. But when you have a long-standing U.S. heritage institution like Carnegie Hall, unsurprisingly, there's a deep history. For today, we'll look at how the function and history of the hall have always been intertwined. After it opened in 1891, it operated for 70 years as a private business entity under multiple owners, including widow Louise Carnegie and a real estate developer who was key in ensuring the hall would not close as New York City changed around it. In 1960, a coalition of artists and activists achieved protection through an agreement with the city of New York to own the building and for Carnegie Hall to operate as a not-for-profit. This achievement was significant as an early historical and cultural preservation attempt in the U.S., resulting from a combination of public outcry and targeted social and political lobbying. A few short decades later, the Rose Archives and Museum is founded um, to collect and manage the history of the building and its business. In its nearly 100-year history up to that point, this was the first centralized attempt to create sustained organization and access to information. It all started with a seemingly benign request in the 1980s for a list of performances, only to find there was no list, nothing to make the list out of, and no one to make or update the list. A budding archivist and longtime Carnegie Hall employee was chosen to start the archives, and our founder, Gino Francesconi, worked tirelessly to build a performance history and begin capturing the hall's stories. He dug through dumpsters, connected with families of Andrew Carnegie and other important figures from our history, and sorted through corporate and business files to find any route of discovery for possible material. We continue to see the most impactful way we collect, organize, and allow access to history is through people's own connection to the hall. In the first few years of the archives in the 80s and 90s, a call for material was posted as an advertisement in the printed AARP magazine, which led to people mailing the archives their most prized, precious mementos. The mail was full every single day for years at the office um, from people who were looking for their memories to be part of the hall's collections. I see the same thing happening now with digital material and data. People want to be able to share and find out as much as they can about their own relationship with the hall and often generally provide personal and professional research, references, or even item donations to continue this connection. Starting in the early 2010s and with the rise of available internet and technology, archives could enable less mediated access to its information, allowing for greater discovery and use and the ability to search with more freedom and flexibility. For me, the continuation of this work is a functional digital asset management environment that serves archives, nuanced and preservation and archiving needs. Next, we will walk through the increasingly exciting ways we can leverage JAM to serve current and future audiences while ensuring respect and care for the subjects in our history. Let's look at how we translate the actions of archiving into DAM activities. And I would love to tell you the first decade of DAM at Carnegie Hall was as consistent and straight as a timeline. That would be a lie. But what we are able to observe overall is a direct connection between archives activities and business and operational improvements via the DAMs. In the arts, and performing arts especially, operational funding is a common goal for staff, program, and technology budgets. And it can also be an equally uncommon source for these same areas. So back in the early 2000s, digitization grants rarely included support for the files and metadata created from the digitization process from an analog source. In 2013, the Digital Archives Project, or DAP, ensured that digitization and digital asset management always went hand in hand and acknowledged that we need to be able to responsibly preserve the products of digitization. The project avoided having to start new projects or technology purchases to achieve various levels of management and access. This specific strategy played a huge role in our ability to responsibly preserve and present the hall's past, present, and future. In 2015, Archives integrated authoritative performance and entity data into the dams to build the backbone of our collection structure. 
This led to vastly improved data quality and control and reinforced an effort in archives to reflect the connectedness of the hall into its technology practices. The year had another significant achievement, operational funding and staffing. What is now called the digital collections wrote into a policy, a requirement for a plan for digital assets and ongoing management activities as responsibilities of the archives, including eventual online public access to materials. Over the next five years, Carnegie Hall began to understand the magnitude of what was being undertaken. In addition to being an enterprise dams, it would also serve as our first ever public discovery layer for collections. In light of this, and with the support of stakeholders, the effort shifted the Digital Archives Project into the Digital Collections Initiative, a label which better reflected the reach and resources needed to support internal enterprise use, the public's eventual use, and long-term digital preservation and access to these materials. At the end of this very exciting and very busy period, we rolled out the system for use by staff and partners in fall 2017. The following year, we focused on preparing material for public access and redesigning the dam's interface with active feedback from staff. I'll use this moment to remind us all that in each one of these efforts involved dozens or more of stakeholders, often working outside their usual areas of business to support the public release of historic material. Um, as a result, the archives was able to release over 80,000 items in 2019 via our dams, reaching users in over 100 countries. Although 2020 does not exist on this slide, impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic significantly changed how audiences access and relate to Carnegie Hall. Because of earlier decisions we made to prioritize staff buy-in in the dams, we were able to provide a smoother transition for staff experiencing unplanned remote work when the hall's building closed. The immediate increase in online programming from our education, marketing, and artistic programming departments was served well by the expedited response and request fulfillment options via the dams. So for us, 2021 marked a moment of reflection and a need for revised priorities. As a result, the archives engaged a departmental data management consultant to evaluate current and future capacity for serving the institution and our public audience. This work revealed a number of seemingly unrelated business areas, which were actually informed or impacted by archives resources, and also identified opportunities for dams optimization that could lead to business, business improvements across the hall. We also learned how to more effectively advocate cross-departmentally and find common use cases. The data management evaluation pointed us towards efficiency as the next focus of our work. We are currently piloting ways archives can now effectively provide archival guidance in enterprise technology and governance projects by the IT, web, and digital media departments. Before I hand it over to Jen, I just wanted to say thank you to her and to all of you for your attention. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Gruneberg, and I'm the Digital Collections Associate at the Carnegie Hall Rose Archives. I work with the team to manage both our historical digital material and our current event photography workflows. I'll be discussing what the second decade of dams looks like at Carnegie Hall with a focus on how we manage our event photography. I'll share projects we're currently working on along with areas we're focused on making improvements in. There are three large areas of event photography that we work with. We have uh, pre-1990 analog material. This includes digitized prints, negatives from photographers. We even have sketches from um, either audience members or artists done during performances. And this category is typically digitized by a vendor and added to the dams by the archives team. Moving into the 1990s to the 2010s, most material was delivered on CDs or DVDs, hard drives. Um, we do use vendors for some of this work, but we do transfer a lot of the material from the external media um, to the dam ourselves. And for current event photography, 2020s to present, both staff and photographers have access and ability to upload directly to the dam. Now let's talk about some of our works in progress. One of my focus areas has been migrating content into the dam. We add new material every day. 
one of the more important content types we manage and make available are our digitized concert programs from early in the Hall's history. Um, some are available in the dam, some are available publicly, and then some are still stored on network storage. Um, staff, researchers, media, marketing use the programs in some way in their work, so they're an important content type for us to manage. And because photography from that time, think around like 18, late 1800s to early 1900s, was limited or too costly, sometimes the concert program is the only material we have from the event. Programs from 1891 to 1920 are publicly available to view and download on our digital collections, but we're constantly working to add more. One of the areas we'd like to improve on, improve on is the upload process. The current upload process is a bit disjointed and done ad hoc when staff or researchers um, ask requests. So we're working to develop an upload schedule. For material we want to release publicly, this upload schedule would um, be based on when material enters the public domain, which starting in 2024 will be material up to and including 1928. But beyond 1928, we're always working to make more concert programs available for staff to use as reference as well. By developing a schedule, we hope to eliminate the amount of manual research that staff have to do when looking for the programs because not all of them are discoverable in the dams. When there's a request, we often have to source the program files from our network storage, upload them, tag them, make them available, and it can just be a time consuming process. So we leverage scripts to ingest and tag the programs, doing so in large batches. And our material is often organized or thought of as event only, or rather like event focused. So we use the dams to um, pull event information to associate the digital object to the actual event record that it belongs to, to maintain proper organization in the dam. The program you see, kind of the more gray one, um, is a program from December 26, 1912. It's one of my favorites. And the one on the lower right, the more tan colored one, um, is actually the original sketch donated to us by the publisher. And I went and found this in our on-site archive storage and took a picture of it for this presentation. Another content area we're working on migrating is event photography from older or obsolete media types. Um, as Catherine mentioned, given the Hall's long history, we have a lot of legacy material stored on a variety of older media types. Uh, the stack of CDs you see here um, is a great example. I took a picture of this in the archives. It's um, how material would have been sent to us in the 90s, early 2000s. But one of the really interesting elements of working with this earlier event photography is getting to see kind of career spanning images from different artists who've had a long history with the hall. I think Yo-Yo Ma is a great example, who I believe debuted in the 70s, um, but staff and, and myself get to see the material from earlier in his career to now. And the decisions we make around tagging the current event photography absolutely informs how we tag the uh, legacy material. So it's kind of a nice evolution of, or circular evolution of uh, tagging. And the, this material is reused by SAF. It serves as a reference point and even sometimes an inspiration for planning future events. I know the special events team has said that they use this material when looking at decor or table setting when planning future events. Uh, and again, we make use of DAMS API to add standard and controlled metadata to make it available for staff. The other main focus area of mine is standardization. Uh, much like this wonderful dance group you see here practicing in one of the Carnegie Hall studios, we'd like to create uniformity in some of our workflows in the DAMS. One of those workflows is the staff upload process. Uh, there's almost always something happening at the hall, and because of that, we have photography incoming every day. Uh, photographers do upload directly into the dams, but so does staff, and sometimes the asset library can become unwieldy quickly. So we'd like to create templated forms that staff can use to add descriptive metadata at the time of upload to limit the amount of untagged material coming in. And within those templated forms, we'd like to set rules and conditions to move along workflows without archive staff having to intervene. So for example, 
an asset has these particular required fields on them and has been reviewed by a certain staff member, go ahead and upgrade the asset for staff reference so that um, it's accessible sooner. And our goal with all of this standardization is to reduce the amount of time that material spends in a pending process state. The last area of standardization is our ever-growing variety of events at the hall. Um, quite a bit more than just music happens at the hall. Maybe we're not presenting the Society of American Magicians like we did in 1912, but we do have a diverse calendar of events, each with their own set of characteristics. And we'd like to further refine and build on our categorization of events into meaningful buckets. For example, performance versus non-performance based events, photo shoots, things like that. Determining the characteristics of each event will help us define the metadata requirements for that particular event type. And within that exercise, we'd like to determine what metadata can be derived from other elements so that we can create more automations um, on metadata creation so staff don't have to enter things that we can infer from other data points. All of this will help us to scale to meet the needs of the hall. Each year, as I said, there's new event types and new types of material coming into the dam. Um, for future decades of DAM at Carnegie Hall, we'd like to build on the operational uh, efficiencies and gains that we've made and work to formalize a DAM governance that will better support staff and the archives as a whole. And I want to say thank you so much. Um, it's been wonderful to share our work here at Carnegie Hall, and I think now we can move into questions if there are any. Well, not too surprisingly, just a few have come in. Uh, Jen, thank you and Catherine both for the effort to put this together. And Catherine, your recording was excellent, although uh, probably an unexpected experience for you. So I, I'll ask a, a couple of questions. This one I, I thought was very thoughtful. My organization, my organization's archive is extensive and we are looking to move to a new MAM, it says in particular. And here's the question. Ideally, We'd like to clean up some assets we may no longer need, but it's hard to know what archival assets will be needed in the future. Can you share some suggestions about how to balance this? You're both muted. So it's... Ah, sorry about that. Yeah, that works much better. <laughs> um, well, I'm wondering if Catherine has any she put any she did put something in the in the chat typing here um which i'm not sure that i can see uh anyway i i, I, can, I think that yeah i have the access to read this so um i'll be your uh i'll be your speaker you. here uh wishing you luck on your new ma'am journey my perspective of the dam as a place for archival decisions in the acquisition, in the acquisition and deaccession, to be, is to be put into policy via the system. These policies grow as a work in progress. DAM can provide a point of entry to for non-experts about how archives keep content actively described, managed, and appropriately accessible. Explaining that everything can be kept brings with it a responsibility that our fellow staff can better understand as we provide DAM services. So just a bit of guidance on collaboration and Catherine continues purposeful environmental, these in, de purposeful development of these policies and implementations is key. Thank you, Catherine. Let me go back over there. Jen, anything you wanna to add to that? No, no, I think we covered that. Okay. So uh, another question came in. Surprised not to hear a bit more about uh, audio and wondering if you can share some perspective on that. Sure. We have a small amount of audio visual material that's available publicly online, um, but in terms of what's for staff and what comes in from event photography, we have quite a mix of you know, legacy material from Open Reel to Betacam SP from, you know, the 80s and 90s that we've 
use an outside vendor to digitize and then we make available for staff reference only or even sometimes for very specific research requests. Um, and yeah, it's definitely a, a material type that we, we work with. Um, we work very closely with our digital media team as well to make you know, short snippets of things, clips from opening night, remarks, um, things like that for staff to reference in, in the dam. Yeah, Catherine has also commented that much of the material that may be audio in nature is highly rights controlled and generally not seen as one of the roles that DAM is there to provide for live performance or reiterative iterative performance material. So I know the hall from the time I've had a chance to be up there is, is quite sensitive to rights, royalties, intellectual property control, and the governance of those assets, both archivally as well as in their present form, is a, a manner of in, intense scrutiny before things that may be in the archive ever see the light of more general access. And it's out of respect for the artist and for the other, other covenants that may have arrived along with those. Uh, another question that came in, uh, are you using APIs for any connectivity? And along with that, uh, how do you manage the upload of born digital content? So I'll let you parse those two questions. Sure, I can speak to how we use APIs. We currently mostly use them internally to make large batch edits to things in the dam. So if I need to change, you know, a, a, a copyright, let's say, on thousands and thousands of image, I'll use an API along with some Python scripting, uh, very basic Python scripting to make that work. Uh, we have plans, though, to kind of build a more like automated procedural API environment where we might connect um, in different ways to the dam API instead of just kind of an, a one user interacting with the dam um, kind of a, a, to build something more two-way. Um, and then David, what was, remind me the second part of the question was how we upload. Born digital content. Mm, um, so it depends. We have uh, photographers that upload material like from an event that happened last night there's an external photographer process where they can upload uh, material right into the dam and then let's see i've got a bit of an answer from Catherine. oh sure sure <laughs> so, so um, we saw the flying fingers on camera there Catherine. it's quite you know expressive so born digital objects are uploaded as you said jen every day by current and active content for current and active content by staff and photographers for archival, in quotes, born digital material, we acquire the most future-proofed format and context that we can still, that still can, is understandable for non-archivists. And again, having had the privilege to have been at the hall, the deep-rooted ethic of understanding that this is an archive for an indeterminate, indeterminate future this is an archive that looks at the horizon and says, what do I have to be ready for? I think that phrase in there uh, of future-proof content for now and in the future is part of the deep ethic that runs through the work that both the, the entire team does there at the hall and always a, a keen awareness. So one final question and then as we wrap up, um, Jen, what were some things that uh, if you could, that surprised you in Dam becoming such a central role at the hall? Great question. Um, probably how similar it is to other data management jobs and environments I've worked in. Mm -hmm. The underlying structure of working with information is there, there are parallels to working in, you know, enterprise like, like I, I previously came from. Um, and then the second would probably be the strength of the users and working with them to build what works best for them, maybe not necessarily what might be the most standard or I don't want to say best practice, but um, hearing and listening to the user probably. Great. Well, thank you. And Catherine, thanks so much for chiming in in 
uh, in a manner of typing speaking. We're <laughs> and the so semi live from Carnegie Hall, Catherine and Jen. Thank you both for your time today. I look forward to seeing you in the near future. We appreciate it. Thank you.